They're the toughest warriors in the world. No! Do you have what it takes to be part of this elite group? You're about to find out. How much are they paying me for this? Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Congressman Ron Paul was one of the surprises of the 2008 presidential campaign. He attracted a passionate following, including many younger voters. And actually, 75-year-old congressman from Texas is back in the race for the 2012 election. David Brody has this look at the candidate and what he stands for. Ron Paul may not have the presidential look or the campaign machine, but what he does have is a movement. Ron Paul was a tea partier before it was cool to be one. For 30 years, he's been talking that talk. In 2008, he wrote The Revolution, a manifesto. And a year later, the Tea Party popped up and invaded the GOP. When I go to the Republican meetings, there was a time when they didn't invite me to the Republican meetings, but now I go and a lot of times they look like my rallies. His supporters are passionate, to say the least, and some might call them rabid. Just this week, an online fundraiser called the Revolution vs. Romney Care raised $1 million in one day as they slapped the big government label on Mitt Romney's Massachusetts health care plan. Paul's money bombs, as they are called, get results. In the 2008 campaign, one day's effort raked in $6 million. While still dubbed as a candidate who can't win, Paul thinks the landscape has changed. If you ask me if that is true, I would say, yeah, partially so, more true four years ago than now. But, you know, we had a campaign, this thing shifted last, four years ago. I was either excluded or laughed at and sometimes booed but not in the last four years. Paul's economic positions clearly resonate with all the attention on the country's deficit, but his non-intervention foreign policy is outside of the GOP mainstream, especially his hands-off approach to Israel. For that matter, Paul wants the government to pretty much stay out of everything. He's earned the nickname Dr. No, because he says no to virtually all federal government spending. He positions himself as the guy who would cut the size of government more than any candidate out there. I think foreign welfare and corporate welfare and bank bailout welfare and all this kind of stuff, we can save a lot of money that way without doing all the social programs. But eventually it, it all has to be cut, you know, but uh, I, I think I can come across a little bit more compassionate than some people uh, think I am. <laughs> Paul typically polls around 10 percent or so. It's roughly the middle of the pack. So even if Ron Paul never becomes president, who knows? There may be a senator out there who just happens to be his son who might inherit the movement. If there's never a president Ron Paul, there may be a president Rand Paul in the future. Mm -hmm. Time will tell. <laughs> For now, though, Ron Paul and his revolution march on. David Brody, CBN News, Washington. We're going to be get, bringing you profiles of all the candidates so that you can um, make informed decisions. You can keep up with it with the latest from David Brody by checking out the Brody file on CBNNews.com. Lee Webb has the rest of our top stories from the CBN Newsroom. Lee? Gordon, this Sunday, Turkey will hold elections that many analysts believe could have a profound impact on the U.S., Israel, and the Middle East. The outcome may determine the influence that a more radical form of Islam has on the region. Chris Mitchell has the story now from Istanbul. Turkey is in the final days of a campaign that will affect one of the U.S.'s biggest Middle East allies for years to come. The elections center around one party and one man. Here in Istanbul, it's hard to escape posters of Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan, the head of the ruling Islamist party called the AKP. Polls point to a sizable victory by the AKP, and that would mean the third straight election win for a party that's worked hard to make one of the most secular Muslim nations in the earth more and more Islamic. Political adversaries say the world is finally seeing the real Erdogan. CBN News found the number two man in Turkey's main opposition party campaigning in Istanbul's main square. The dear prime minister in America and Europe was very popular and they supported him in 2004 and 2007. And his mask looked very liberal, but now they see that he is not liberal. 
his restricted freedom. And the journalists can't express themselves because of the prime minister. Therefore, the mind of Erdogan is fascist, and it is a dictatorial regime. Some accuse the AKP of using democracy to gain power and then limit freedoms. We asked Erdogan's second-in-command about those charges. Some people might not enjoy the fact that Turkey is becoming a stronger country. We can understand their feelings, but Turkey is becoming more and more democratic every day. But if Erdogan's party wins a majority of seats in the election, some fear he'll rewrite Turkey's constitution, set up a presidential system, and consolidate his power. The AKP party is closely linked to the worldwide Gulen Islamic movement, and some even feel he hopes to re-establish an Islamic caliphate with Turkey as its head. Whatever the outcome of Sunday's elections, Turkey will be a different country come Monday. What kind of country is still to be decided? That's why many Christians in the Middle East are praying for Turkey and the future of the region. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Istanbul. And here at home, a federal judge has ruled that businesses can give money directly to political candidates. The Virginia judge struck down the ban on those contributions in a case two weeks ago. The Obama administration, though, asked the judge to reconsider his decision. He did, but he upheld his ruling. He said businesses have a right to make contributions to candidates because they're a form of free speech and protected by the Constitution. For more on this story, let's go back to Gordon. Well, we've got Jay Sekulow with us from the American Center for Law and Justice. Uh, Jay, this one is, I, I think, is, is significant. For it the is. first time, a federal judge says the ban on, on corporate contributions is unconstitutional. Yeah. Do you think it's going to last? I do think it's going to last because if you look at what's happened in the Supreme Court with the Citizens United case, which was the big case after McCain-Feingold, uh, the fact of the matter is the court is consistently striking these prohibitions or bans down as unconstitutional violating free speech. Mostly because Justice O'Connor was on the court uh, during the McCain-Feingold cases. I was one of the lawyers that argued McCain-Feingold, and she is now off the court. And the replacements have been Alito and Roberts and so forth. So the court's gone better on free speech when it comes to election law, and they're protecting the speech rights. So if McCain-Feingold, for instance, which was the huge case, the bipartisan campaign finance case, if that case were decided today, it would have come out completely different. We no. won our provision, by the way, Title III, which was the prohibition on minors participating in political campaigns. But, Gordon, this is huge because, and I think you're right, I think this case, as they continue to move up, uh, you're starting to see a coalescing where courts are just striking these provisions as violating free speech. And this was with, you know, business contributions, so it's a little bit different. Let's go back in the history of it. Yeah. Um, all this came out of the 72 election and, and what happened with the Nixon campaign. Right. And the sense in Congress was we need to rein it back in because right. it looks like politicians are being bought by big corporations. Right. Um, it, you know, we, we just ran the story that uh, Paul was able to raise a million in a day, six million in a day. It, are, 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 are we still in that same kind of environment that we have to worry about big corporations buying candidates? Well, you know, it was a couple of things. It was the big corporations buying candidates, what was called conduit giving, which was individual, there'd be limits put in place, and then people would give around those limits. Uh, but you know what? The, the overreach here, though, is they do these bans. Instead of saying, you know, we're going to limit it to X, Y, or Z or a certain amount, they'll say complete prohibitions. And there's a significant constitutional difference between a, a limit, which may or may not be legitimate, by the way, versus a complete ban. The idea that you could ban an entire category of speech, which is what the corporate political contribution ban did, is unconstitutional. Now, are there dangers if corporations can buy candidates? Sure. You've got to be careful about that. But, you know, I, I really like free speech, and there's corporations on both sides of the issue, and I think the robust marketplace is better than government regulation at the end of the day. Can't you solve the buying a candidate problem just by disclosure? Of course. And that's the interesting thing here. They, they will say that there's no, this has to be the least restrictive alternative whenever you're dealing with free speech. What's the least restrictive? Well, the least restrictive would be disclosing who the donor is. That's, you know, not unusual. We have to, look, as individuals, we have to do that on federal election campaigns. Why not do that at the corporate level instead of a ban? So I think the reality is, and I think what the uh, courts are quickly realizing, and those that are opposed to corporations participating in the free speech process, uh, is that those, the days of, of, of prohibitions on free speech of corporations is over with. And in a sense, it's the Supreme Court's earlier decisions which said corporations have free speech rights, too, because they have to engage the marketplace. Right. So this idea that this is some kind of new idea, that's not true at all. It's been recognized for over 40 years. There's, a, there's an argument within the free speech, and I, just 
for clarity, I'm, I'm in favor. <laughs> I'm in favor of robust market and, and everybody gets sure. to participate. There's an argument that by limiting uh, and prohibiting corporate contributions, you've actually created the lobbying industry. Sure. And that is a shadow thing where you don't know what's going on. There is no disclosure right. required. It's all underground, and it's who's got the influence within the beltway. Exactly. It's almost like a shell game. You, in other words, I can't do it directly. Therefore, I hire a lobbying group that I pay hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars millions. to, and they get my information to those same candidates who then also make contributions, have their friends make contributions. So I think, you know, I'm with you. Remove the restrictions. Stop the shell games. Let them in engage it directly because there are going to be corporations on both sides of issues. But why should they not be able to protect uh, protect their own political interests, which affects their business, their employees, their staff, I think they should. Do you think Congress is going to get into the act now? Um, you know, there, there, there's also another argument that all the campaign restrictions passed in the 70s were incumbent protection acts. Yeah. That when you limit contributions to 2000 to an individual, you prohibit corporate, uh, you create this sort of PAC environment. Yeah. The PACs will, the lobbyists, the PACs, will support the incumbent. They will not support the challenger. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. So you've created yeah. a, I get to stay in office the rest of my life. You know, it, they used to call it the Incumbent Protection Act. I mean, because it re in reality it did, because your ability to challenge the incumbent when you've got these really significant restrictions was very difficult. So I think, but Congress is going to have to tread carefully here because you always have this call for reform. But I think between now and the next election, Nothing happens mm -hmm. on a whole host of issues, including this one. And the courts are not hospitable to con congressional oversight here to the significant degree that the initial bipartisan campaign uh, re finance reform tried to get in place. I think those days are done, at least for now. Now, the Supreme Court, you know, another change in one justice, and you could have a whole different story. But uh, right well, now, I think we're okay. As this case moves forward, could yeah. this literally break through all of that and yeah. put the whole Federal Election Commission regulations at I think state. I think that's exactly I think you're exactly correct, and it will probably come down to I mean you, when you argue the case you've got to you know you always argue to nine, but you've got to argue to five, but in this case I think it's going to be one, and that's going to be Justice Kennedy. Um, but mm. Justice Kennedy on, uh, has not liked these restrictions on speech, so I'm I'm optimistic uh, at the end of the day that these restrictions go, and if there are other things that need to be put in place like disclosure, fine, do it. But this idea where you silence the corporations from speaking, I think that's dangerous. I mean I think that's who, why would we do that? We believe in robust and freedom and this idea that all sides can engage the marketplace. And let's stop the move it around to this group to get it, my point across. Believe me, the corporation is going to get their point across one way or another. Directly is better than the other. All right. Well, Jay, thanks for being with us. Thanks, and um, keep in mind that, that how, how much have we lost free speech in America where you've got to run through regulations before you can even give a contribution to a candidate for office. Uh, and, and when we keep that in mind, uh, we realize how far we've come. Christy, over to you. Thank you so much, Gordon. Well, coming up, get a taste of what it's like actually to be a U.S. Navy SEAL. In actual SEAL training, exercises like this are designed to teach these guys what they're capable of and push them beyond their physical limits. And that's why only about 20% of them actually make it to the end of SEAL training. We'll take you through the Navy SEAL experience up next. Do you have money to burn? If not, you need to know that the paper dollars you're invested your life savings in are being consumed right now in a growing blaze of inflation and declining value. Economists know why the dollar is burning and at risk of crashing. It's because politicians and central bankers keep printing them. And this makes the dollars you've worked so hard for worth less and less. The politicians and bankers hated the gold standard because it forced them to be honest. That's why the U.S. dollar keeps losing value and could soon crash. The good news is that you can create your own personal gold standard and keep your savings protected when the dollar crashes. Call or visit online now. Find out more about the best performing assets of the 21st century from the best company in the country, Swiss America. Monday. I aspire to, uh, to greatness. An Olympic hopeful with gold medal dreams. I really believed uh, were achievable for me. Until this former ski star wiped out. My name is Scott Arnold. 
and I used to be a dumpster diver. Plus. Basically, I had tumors in my body. Cancer riddled her body. Was pretty much near death. How she was healed without surgery on the 700 Club. Well, the Navy SEALs became superheroes in the eyes of millions of Americans when they tracked down Osama bin Laden. The country remains fascinated with these elite special forces. And as Chuck Holton found out, many people want to know what it takes to be part of the team. The U.S. Navy SEALs are legendary for their toughness and tenacity. These highly trained warriors spend years honing their skills on land, sea, and air. As a former Army Ranger, I wanted to find out if SEAL training was as tough as everyone says. But I'm not about to join the Navy to find out. This is the Extreme SEAL Experience. Situated just outside Norfolk, Virginia, the week-long course gives regular folks a taste of the real thing. I have to stencil my t-shirt with my last name front and back so I can remember who I am. I wanted to see if I still had what it takes, so I signed up. Fifteen others showed up the first day, regular guys from all different backgrounds. A retired Navy SEAL, Senior Chief Don Shipley, runs the program with the help of other former SEALs. All the instructors are SEALs, and we've all been through Hell Week, we've all done the deployments, we know what it takes to get through that uh, training. Good morning, ladies. The extreme SEAL experience starts with a surprise wake-up call at 0230. Two o'clock in the morning, time to get comfortable being uncomfortable. I knew a long, hard day was on the horizon. Back in ranger school, man. The week-long course starts with over 24 hours of grueling physical and mental challenges. All right, it's time to go get on the bus. The first day of training that we run down here is called Hell Night. It's a simulation of Hell Week and BUDS, kinda. BUDS stands for Basic Underwater Demolition School, the six-month training all Navy SEALs must complete. The most intense part, Hell Week. 132 hours that push men past their breaking points, much of it done in the cold ocean water. Most who entered the school drop out during this phase. If I was running actual SEAL training down here, I'd be I'd back in ambulances in here every day. The next 24 hours were nonstop action, starting with a 10-mile paddle. Eight men crammed into each boat, and navigating the river in complete darkness was more difficult than I anticipated. It was a pretty good teamwork exercise, kind of getting to know each other and uh, trying to figure out, uh, you know, how we're, how we're going to work together and make this happen. We ended up in front of a stagnant, algae-infested pond. Then the fun began. Two foot forward, boop. Nothing like pond scum for breakfast. But there's a method to the madness. Special operators can't afford to be squeamish. I get the feeling it's gonna get a lot harder from here. <laughs> Next came lots and lots and lots of physical training, or PT. It's hundreds of push-ups, sit-ups, flutter kicks, and whatever else the instructors can dream up. The art of camouflage is vitally important, as SEALs must regularly operate behind enemy lines. How much are they paying me for this? And before every new activity, more physical training. All these guys behind me have come from all over the United States and Canada and paid between $1,500 and $3,000 for a couple weeks of training to find out one thing, and that's if they have what it takes to be a Navy SEAL. Back straight, heads up, down. If the push-ups weren't perfect, we had to start over. Log PT is designed to force the men to work as a team under very arduous conditions. The course isn't just about running and push-ups. We also learn some tactical skills, like hand-to-hand -hand combat and how to transition silently from water to land. In actual SEAL training, exercises like this are designed to teach these guys what they're capable of and push them beyond their physical limits. And that's why only about 20% of them actually make it to the end of SEAL training. 
All right, so we'll hit these two danger crossings. The highlight of Hell Knight is a simulated mission. It's the payoff for all the hard work. Go guys, lift her up. The guys must use all the skills learned throughout the day to complete the operation. These weekend warriors get painted up, paddle down river under the cover of darkness, hike through dense forest. A small taste of what life must be like as a real Navy SEAL. For these guys, this is better than spending vacation sitting on the beach. The reward is knowing they challenged themselves and made it through, going back home with a little more self-confidence, some incredible memories, and a greater respect for the sacrifices made by our nation's special operators. Chuck Holton, CBN News, Chesapeake, Virginia. All right, Christy, I gotta ask you, would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> Brother, you couldn't pay me. In fact, I was sitting there thinking, I'm so glad you assigned him that assignment because if you would assign me, mm-mm. Mm-mm. <laughs> All I kept thinking over, bugs, 2 o'clock in the morning, yeah. I can see you with some pond scum. That would be good. You'd like that. I have no comeback for it. <laughs> All right, what's next? I have no comeback on that one. Well, we love to laugh, as you see. Well, up next, you're going to meet a comedian who says he doesn't just make people laugh. He gives them the ability to laugh. We can do so much more than we think we can do. See why Michael Jr. actually takes the road less traveled up next. Still ahead, she wanted to be the perfect wife. I was addicted to being small. Until it nearly killed her. I got really good at explaining away my weight loss. See what saved her on today's 700 Club. I saw the truth for the first time. This dining set is almost $1,700. This dining set, less than $1,100. This living room, over $4,600. This same living room, $3,500. It's not a sale. It's not a closeout. It's a whole new way to buy over 1 million products for your home, all at huge savings. That's Direct Buy. And right now, you can get a 30-day membership free, so you can start saving today on virtually everything for your home. Our first project with Direct Buy was our kitchen cabinetry, and we saved roughly around $27,000. Direct Buy lets you buy without any of the hidden retail markup you pay in stores, saving you hundreds, even thousands of dollars. Imagine getting this entire room for nearly half of what you pay in stores. Start saving today. Call now for your free 30-day membership certificate. Don't wait. Call Direct Buy at 1-800-839-2075. That's 1-800-839-2075. Call today. To see this week's most viewed stories, go to CBN.com. When Michael Jr. was a teenager, he went to the movies with his friends. Then the projector went out, and Michael decided to jump up and take center stage. And a stand-up comic was born. Well, he's been making people laugh ever since. And recently we caught up with him before an event at a Salvation Army retreat where he shared why his comedy is more than just jokes. When I was a kid, laughing at church was illegal. <laughs> I couldn't laugh at church. Man, I remember one time I'm at, this, I'm at this church, right, and this lady was jumping around and her wig fell off. That stuff was funny, right? <laughs> I laugh, my grandmother pinch and twist. I can understand a pinch, you gonna twist? That's the devil right there. Comedy at best is a seasoning for the Word of God. At best, it's a seasoning. It's not the meat, it's a seasoning to make it more palatable to people who really, really need the meat. Reading the Bible is like paying bills, right? Right, you're supposed to pay attention to everything, but it show up with some red ink, you better do some, right? <laughs> my, my comedy is very purposeful, even when I'm not trying to be. Like God is setting some stuff up in a really cool way, whether I know it or not. I found out Jesus had a little brother. Anybody know his name? James, the first one was James. And when I read that, I was like, man, how much pressure was that? <laughs> Jesus, your big brother? Whew. How many times did you have to hear, why come you can't be more like Jesus, James? Because <laughs> you know everybody probably thought that James could do the same things Jesus could do, but he couldn't, he was just James. He wasn't James Christ. 
What I'm learning is really important that, uh, that Christians laugh, but also it's also important that we be seen laughing. You know, the wedding banquet, Jesus turned water into wine. Everybody was amazed, but they don't tell you about the next banquet. Jesus left early. They started running out of wine. Everybody looked at James. Was like, <laughs> I mean, last time this happened, your brother made some wine, dude. You just gonna stand there with your sandals on? You're not gonna... <laughs> you can't make no Kool-Aid or nothing, man? You know, just... When I was a child, it was hard for me to read. It would mess with my self-esteem. So what I did was I developed this ability to look at a word in seven different ways. I came up with seven different possibilities of what that word could be or different ways to look at it to determine what the word was. And it would always pretty much work. And then when I got a little older, probably around high school, I figured out how to take those same seven different um, viewpoints and apply them to a situation. So any situation that one person would look at in a regular way, I have seven different ways to look at it. And that's exactly where I would draw my comedy from. Now, let's, let's, let's look back. Not being able to read or having a really hard time reading as a child and it messed with my self-esteem was really a plan of the devil. But what the devil meant for bad, God has turned to good because now I use it as my primary tool for developing content for the comedy for the kingdom of God. I love what I do, man. I get to travel all over the world doing comedy. Like, I perform all over. I get to perform at um, the clubs and as well um, churches, which is cool. It's the same show wherever I go because it's the same guy wherever I am. So it's not like I'm doing two different shows, right? So, so and then God gave me this cool comedy accountability. Any comedy that I do uh, at a club has to be clean enough that I could do it at a church, right? But any comedy I do at a church got to be funny enough that I could do it at a club. I was doing a prayer right before I hit the stage in Los Angeles, and uh, I did a prayer, and in an instant, God changed my mindset about comedy. When a comedian gets on stage, he wants to normally, and I was the same way, he wants to get laughs from people. Well, God said, no, don't go up there to get laughs from people. Go up there and give them an opportunity to laugh. The moment I said, yes, God, I'll do this, a woman approached me and asked me about doing comedy for people with AIDS. Before, I'd never, nobody ever approached me with that before. Or my mindset was so that I probably never even noticed it, or I wasn't available to them. So we did this film, Comedy the Road, Let's Travel. We went to four locations across the country and we brought them comedy. Places that, that had, normally don't have comedy. A place called the Samaritan House, everyone there was homeless and they have HIV. We also go to Skid Row and do comedy. We go to a, a youth prison and do comedy. We also go to a place called the Dolphin House so it takes care of abused children. And only with God's strength was I able to do it. So I get up there and I do these, these jokes and people start laughing. And I'm blown away by the fact that they're laughing. Even with all of the hurts and the pains they've been through, they're laughing at my comedy. Because we can do so much more than we think we can do. But we just gotta trust God and step out there. And this film actually motivates people to step out. A lady in Orlando saw this film, and now um, what she does, a, a ballet teacher. And now what she does is on Wednesday night, she teaches homeless children how to dance ballet. So I think this movie, what it, one of the things it does, it motivates people to take what they have and go give it where it's needed. And the blessings and the things you get in return are so much bigger than anything you could ever ask. So, um, and I, I'm starting to see that's really part of my message. That's part of the message that this season of comedy is for, is just to show people that uh, not only that they have value, but other people really need them as well, and they value them as well. A lot of men here, it's cool, man. I thought it was a women's retreat at first. I was, and then I got here, I was like, these are some hard looking women. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I'm glad they're here. I'm glad they're here. There's some guys that, uh, in the audience tonight who've been through some hurt, some pain. Some of them have been homeless. Some of them have been on, on, uh, on drugs and just, just really beat down. And tonight they get to come together and laugh. Hey, you got an accent like that from Chicago. <laughs> My name is Julian. My name is Julian. Oh, the South Side. Oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. Used to saying your name after you've been running. That's why it is. It's Julian, 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 Julian. And my job tonight isn't so much to uh, to give them any sort of message. It's really about just having them laugh. The message will show up. I'm just saying. I don't know what the message is going to be, but I know, like I know, God has something really cool in store, and I just get to be kind of an audience member and find out what that is as it happens, even if it's coming through me. So it's gonna be really, really cool, I'm excited. I just love 
bringing laughter to people. So it's, it's like mad cool. I love it. That night, 89 men accepted Christ and their hearts were open. You were just reacting. Well, I had my I, own little focus group going on. Over I here. love him. I love laughter. Well, you know me. It's kind of like it just it breaks down barriers, you know. I mean, even today, I came in this morning kind of with a little attitude. I was upset about something. You? Yeah, I was. I know it doesn't happen. And I don't believe it. <laughs> It's true. And something that he Your said. sweetness all the time. All, all the time. Well, you know, yeah. So. What's up and so am I. <laughs> Wait. But let me. Anyway. <laughs> but something that he said I loved. He said you got to change your perspective. And laughter. It's not just about making people laugh. but showing them. What was that line? Showing them that they can laugh or that mm -hmm. it's something like that. Right. I don't know. But even just watching that piece and me laughing broke the stuff that was on my shoulders. I love it. Yeah, I, I, uh, I've gotten the inside story. I talked with him. He was here for the Christmas party. He and, was hysterical. And he said uh, he, he walked, he was going to a comedy club to do an act, and across the street he saw a homeless man. Mm. And God spoke to him and said, what's it going to take to make him laugh? Mm. And, and that really challenged him, uh, you know, to say, how much does laughter liberate us and, and get us out of whatever situation we're in? And, and he said, I, I needed to start taking laughter to the people who are, are downtrodden, that, that, that really have serious problems in the world. So he did that, and, the, and he put a DVD together. Uh, it's called The Road Less Traveled, and he went to the homeless. He went to abused children. He went to HIV patients. He went to imprisoned youth uh, in, in reform school. He, he, he went there, and uh, it's amazing, the transformation. If you want to see it, check out his DVD, uh, and you can find out how you can get a copy on CBN.com, The Road Less Trap. I love it. What does the Bible say? Laughter is a great medicine or some about medicine and it's good. I don't know. It's good for your bones. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, the gospel according to Christian. I know. <laughs> the NIV version. Well, <laughs> amplified. I know. Exactly. Very amplified. All right. Well, coming up, we have an amazing story. She was actually addicted to being skinny. I would always choose to eat and just know in the back of my mind it was just always an option to just go make myself throw up. But see what saved her life up next. Insight into today's events, news you don't get anywhere else, and inspiring stories of hope. Now you can share them with your friends. Go to CBN.com to I Saw It on the 700 Club for a fast, easy way to share your favorite videos. If you have diabetes and love food, pay attention to this free offer. Hi, I'm Nicole Johnson. I've had diabetes for years and I love food. To me, there's nothing tastier than rich chocolate cake, except maybe crispy oven fried chicken or cheesy potato skins. Mmm. Get these recipes and many more free in these amazing diabetes cookbooks. If you have diabetes and are on Medicare, you qualify for these three free cookbooks. Call 1-800-659-5105. Enjoy dozens of yummy recipes for desserts, main dishes, snacks, and more. Plus, get this free guide to planning delicious diabetes-friendly meals. So call now and get cooking. For your three free cookbooks and free meal planning guide, to qualify, call 1-800-659-5105. That's 1-800-659-5105. Welcome back to the 700 Club. This weekend, millions of Christians are expected to take part in the Global Day of Prayer. Believers will hold public gatherings in stadiums, city squares, and parks on Saturday. It's something they've done for the past 10 years. They will repent before God and each other and seek for reconciliation. On June 12th, Pentecost Sunday, congregations in more than 200 nations will observe the Day of Prayer in their church services. And Monday, they'll begin three months of service to their communities, churches working together to help the needy and restore neglected neighborhoods. You can learn more about the Global Day of Prayer on our website, cbnnews.com. Operation Blessing is helping to fight child abuse and trafficking in Brazil. Hundreds of youth filled the streets of 11 cities across Brazil to raise awareness. Each person held a candle. Every 15 seconds, a small group of people blew out their candles, and that represents the fact that every 15 seconds, a child in Latin America is sexually abused. 
This year's cities were chosen because they will be the host cities for the 2014 World Cup soccer tournament. Big events like that attract what's called sexual tourism, and it only increases the nation's problem. You can find out how to help and uh, get involved with Operation Blessing by going to its website at ob.org. Gordon and Christie will be back with more of the 700 Club after this. Amanda had $3,000 until her transmission went. Rick had $4,000 before his engine died. Sue has no money and her onboard computer broke. No one likes putting money into their car for repairs. Get AutoAssure and be assured you won't have to. With AutoAssure, you never have to put money into expensive covered repairs. You keep it. It's guaranteed protection. You can keep your mechanic, your dealer. AutoAssure pays them directly. You choose the coverage you need on any make or any model car, and you don't lay out a penny. Not for a fuel injection system, air conditioning, suspension system, or anything else. We all want to keep our cars longer. The choice is yours. Do you want to pay for expensive auto repairs or let AutoAssure pay them for you? Call right now and get a bonus package worth $100 that includes roadside assistance, towing, and rental car coverage for peace of mind. Call AutoAssure at 1-800-781-8910 right now and stop putting money into auto repairs. Go to AutoAssure.com or call 1-800-781-8910 now. My name is Roger Stump, and I'm a cancer survivor. The surgeon said it's inoperable. It's already in your liver. My wife, Brenda, sat there and cried, and I'm thinking... I can't die right now. I'm only 52 years old. I was so distraught. I've heard Cancer Treatment Centers of America had experience with pancreatic cancers. It was like night and day. The hospital just breeds an environment of hope. You'd get a CT scan, and the next morning, the results were read to you. We'd go up there. I just knew it was going to be a good result. You could just see the joy on Dr. Granick's face. Call now and we'll show you how the most compassionate people anywhere put you at the center of everything we do. Together, we'll explore real treatment options you may not even know exist. Cancer Treatment Centers of America is such a different place because they give you hope. I would strongly urge you to call them and, and get a second opinion. Please call today. Well, they say that if you repeat a lie enough times, people will believe it. Amy Woods actually knows that fact from experience. She was lied to her entire life, and that lie was killing her. There were times when um, at night in my bedroom I would do like workout routines. Um, I know that I was very aware of wanting to make sure I looked like all of the other girls in high school. and. Um, team cheerleading. Amy Wood's struggle with her body image carried over into her marriage to husband Brian. It was about six months into our marriage that I officially started making myself throw up. And I was just very determined to appear always that I was the perfect wife. The pressure Amy put on herself to maintain that image was too much. She desperately grasped for control in her own life and weight. But I would just eat super small amounts. And then I went from eating those same things and not swallowing it, just spitting it in the trash. But then I remember loving to eat. I would always choose to eat and just know in the back of my mind it was just always an option to just go make myself throw up. And in, in, in the beginning it was, it was not very often. And then it would go to every day. And then it would go to several times a day. Brian was a medical resident and worked long hours at the hospital. Amy had no problems hiding her bulimia from him. I got really good at lying and explaining away my weight loss. My face was very sunken in and I was way smaller than a person my height should be and people noticed. The battle continued through three pregnancies and 11 years of marriage. It's like a drug. It's like a drug with people that they don't want to do that, but they can't help it. And I was addicted to being small. I was addicted to being in control. In 2005, Amy was out on the front porch watching her kids play. I just prayed for the first time and I said, God, I don't know what it is I'm missing. I don't get it. God took me on a little journey, I guess. And it was sort of like a movie clip where he took me back through some times when I heard things from 
family members or from society. When you're fat, you're not lovable. He took me back through relationships that I had in high school that the boyfriends that would say that really my value came from being pretty or small, and I believed it. The doctor telling me I was two pounds from being what they call obese, and I wasn't, but I believed it. At the end of each one, he kept telling me how much he loved me and how that was not who I was. At the very end, I was on a boat, and my kids were on the boat with me, and the boat was sinking. And he said, you're taking your children there too. And in that moment, I knew that I could no longer live like that. And it was not going to be my own strength and my own power that would make it different. be different. It was going to be Him. For the first time, I knew that I was going to be able to get up from that porch and walk away from the actual behavior of making myself throw up. I was transformed in that moment. I saw the truth for the first time. She finally told Brian everything. He reacted with just love, support, just no judgment from him whatsoever. He was sad. I mean, he was sad that I had believed those things about myself. In reality, my husband always found me attractive. It was my mind, it was the lies that I was believing about myself that made me go there. So I want my kids to know um, where I've been, how the Lord saved me, and it wasn't on my own. I, I didn't do anything to make it better that the Lord did that. And that there's nothing too big, there's no place too far that you've gone that, that God won't be there. I want them to know the places that I've been and the true joy, the tr true freedom you get from God, from Christ alone. Mm. <sighs> what a telling story. What lies have you been telling yourself? What lies are you believing? The lies that say that you're not loved, that you're unworthy, that you're insignificant, that no matter what you do or how hard you try, it's just not good enough. Have you ever said those words, those things, believe those things? I was reading the Word the other day, and in the Word it said that God was talking about how oftentimes we exchange the truth for a lie. We literally have the truth of who God says we are and who He believes we are, and we literally push it away and we believe the lies of the enemy, the lies of things that people have told us that we are unworthy or insignificant or we're stupid or we're fat or we're a failure, whatever it is. Today is the day that I want to not only encourage you, I want to give you the opportunity to change. You see, God's given us the power through His Word to change our mind. You see, the things that we believe because of the things that we have either said or have been said to us go not just in our hearts, but they come through our mind. But God has given us the power to renew our mind with the Word of God because it's the Word of God that penetrates the lie, that breaks it down, that busts it out, and that literally shines through to the truth. Do you know really who you are in Christ? Do you know that Jesus Christ says that you are the head and not the tail? That you are above and not beneath? That you are made in the image of Him. Do you know that He loves you so much that He knows the number of hairs on your head? Do you know that He says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that not one thing about you is a mistake? And do you know how worthy and significant and valuable you are? Not because of what you do or who people think you are or what you say, but because who is in you, and that is Jesus Christ. Today is the day that you have to make the choice and the decision to drown out the lies and to believe the truth of who God says you are. And it all starts with 
choice. You have that choice. So if you don't know who you are in the Lord, it's simple. Pick up the word of God. And every word that you read on that page, let it come through your ears, through your eyes, through your heart, through your soul, and let it cleanse you, because it will. And over time, every time you look in the mirror, you will not see your face, you will not see your flaws, you will not see your brokenness, you will see the reflection of Jesus Christ looking back at you through that mirror. That will happen. If you're struggling right now, I'm gonna pray for you. And I'm gonna pray for you because I know that Jesus loves you, that he can change that thought process, and that he is good for you. So bow your head with me right now. Let's just pray together right now. Lord Jesus, Lord, we just come to you right now and first of all, just repent and ask, Lord, please forgive us for believing the lie, Father God. Lord, you're such a good God to us that you said that we are all these wonderful things, not because of who we are, what we do, but because of who you are in us, Father God. Lord, help us to change from our ways, to see you and to see us the way that you see us, Father God, that we are made in your image, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will heal those broken places, those deep places at the depth of our heart and soul that have been wounded, Father God. Go deep in us and mend those places and restore us. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We glorify you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You see, the Bible says, who the sun sets free is free indeed. And you are set free because Jesus Christ is freedom. So allow him to penetrate your heart and to break those walls down. Listen, I want to encourage you today. We have a pamphlet called Overcoming Eating Disorders. And so if that's your issue, we want to give this to you. But I also want to encourage you as well. Maybe it's just feeling like a failure, insignificant or unworthy or whatever the issue it is. Know that Jesus Christ can help you. Call the number right there, 1-800-759-0700. You can always log on to CBN.com as well just for more information to encourage you. Gordon? Well, still ahead, your questions from our live chat room. Stay tuned for Bring It Online when we come back. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. What makes the miracles of Jesus even more miraculous? Standing where they happened in Israel. Come sail the Sea of Galilee where Jesus calmed a raging storm. Experience Jerusalem, where Jesus restored a paralyzed man. Explore Capernaum, where Jesus spoke a centurion servant into health. To learn more about standing where it all happened in Israel, visit GoIsrael.com. Come visit Israel. You'll never be the same. Monday. I aspire to, uh, to greatness. An Olympic hopeful with gold medal dreams. I really believed uh, were achievable for me. Until this former ski star wiped out. My name is Scott Arnold, and I used to be a dumpster diver. Plus. Basically, I had tumors in my body. Cancer riddled her body. Was pretty much near death. 